Okay, we're good. We're ready? Yeah. yeah. Ready. Right, I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. As the number one best-selling author in persuasion and behavior profiling, I bring my 20-year military career and Harvard education in neuroscience to transform companies and people's ability to understand and leverage the most important thing in success or failure, which is human outcomes. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one body language online course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott Rouse, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right. Which is well, a kick-ass talk- course, by the way. Oh, <laughs> thanks, man. I went thanks. through that. Thank you. Well, today we're going to talk about Sirhan Sirhan. He's the guy that killed uh, Robert uh, Kennedy. So this is going to be fairly interesting because uh, one of us, Chase, has a little uh, experience in the background on this guy in depth. So it should be really interesting. And uh, Greg, you found the video. You want to talk about it? Yeah. So, Scott, let's not say out loud that he killed him. Maybe he didn't. That's become the thing. You know, that's the big rub is whether he actually killed him or he didn't. But this video was from the 1980s. He'd been in prison already for 20 plus years. Uh, 1968, or is it? Yeah, 68 or 69. He shot Robert F. Kennedy. Whether he killed him or somebody else killed him, don't care. We're here to talk about what we see in the body language. And this, he had been in prison long enough that you can see some change to his behavior. Um, We'll go down a quick couple of things I'll mention up front. Yes, he is Palestinian. His family is from uh, Palestine, Israel, whichever part of it you want to call it, but traditionally Palestine. Uh, He was born there. He lived here most of his life. His father is back in Palestine. He is an Orthodox Christian, I believe. So there's a bunch of facts for you. You know, people jump to conclusions about lots of things. Culture plays a part. We'll see some of that. And I'll mention a couple of things when his Arabic takes over his English in the way he communicates. But I think it's a great opportunity to look at one of the most uh, iconic cases still in existence. He's up for parole and has been recommended for parole just recently. He He moved here when he was 12 and kept his Palestinian citizenship, which is important Mm -hmm. for uh, what we're going to be talking about when he's talking about some stuff we're going to see in a minute. Okay. Chase has all the background on this. On, on this, the rest of us don't have as much as he's got, so he'll probably lean into this a little bit heavier than we will. So I can't wait. <laughs> all right, you ready? Yeah. Yep. Let's do it. Right, here we go. One speech that sets you off doesn't doesn't deserve a terrible fate like that. No, I I agree, and I sincerely regret uh, my my actions for that. I was young. I was you know immature. I was wild. I I I really didn't have the the ability to sit back and reflect on it as just one speech, one perhaps one pandering speech to a you know a potential block of voters whom he was appealing to. And now of course I realize that and uh, and, and and I wish that I could reverse all my actions concerning Robert Kennedy. All right, Greg, what do you got? Sure. Having spent a lot of my time with Arabs and knowing the culture, I'm almost surprised he didn't touch his chest as he's being very placative and he's talking to the guy and he he goes down a list of things. He's smiling and making eye contact. You know, eye contact is a very cultural thing. In Americans, we think we make eye contact and we do this constantly. We make about 50% eye contact. In the Middle East, eye contact is more prevalent. You look at someone when you're not thinking and they are very high eye contact. His blink rate goes up and he does kind of a nervous smile. Again, part of a cultural thing for him. And we say it doesn't matter when he came to the US if your culture is surrounding you and you're in an Arab culture, you're around people who are speaking Arabic, your first language patterns your brain, your behaviors and those kinds of things. When he's shaking his head no, that's just negativity about his past. He's not, we always say, somebody out there is gonna say, well, he's lying because he's shaking his head no when he's telling you a story. No, that's negativity about his past. You'll see his eyes drift down to his right as he goes into emotional accessing. Look, this guy spent 20 years of his life at this point for something he did in his youth. And regardless how you feel about that, he's going to have feelings about that. And that's what he's showing. Um, That light talking, you'll hear me often talk about front of mouth speak. 
Well, if you're in Levant dialect or Syrian dialect, whatever you want to call it, of Arabic, it's a lot of it is spoken in the front of the mouth. So it's not abnormal for him to talk this way. And I see him, the only thing I see is when he says, at no, you see concern in his brow. He does a deep swallow, watch the vein in his neck pulse as he's feeling stress from this conversation. That's what I see here. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we're seeing here is he's putting on a face, literally, uh, here. And this smile is a mask that he has progressively started wearing more and more. And this interview took place before a parole board uh, hearing took place. And his demeanor about uh, this regret is truthful. And the recall yes. is absolutely there. And when he mentions uh, uh, a lot of these things that he's mentioning here are things that sound like they're written down. And he's had to make this story up about being upset because his story has dramatically changed over the years. He started out saying he didn't remember anything about being upset. And you can go back and watch videos of his parole board hearings in these times and the parole officers or the parole board members are yelling at him that he should remember, he should remember. So he gets denied parole every time he doesn't remember the story. That's the story of his life. He's He's been on parole for 16 times now, and this is, this is the time now that we're making this video. Uh, as of yet, he's still incarcerated. Uh, but one part that drops his entire mask, and you can watch this again here when you when the video comes back up, is wishing he could take all of his actions back. You can see the entire face shift at the moment before this video ends. So when it comes back on, the moment before the video ends, you to watch that the entire face shifts. The mask actually does come off. Scott, what do you got? All right. So I'm going to go on what we're looking at uh, expression wise. That's what I want to go down on this because. Um, I'm not, I don't know the background of him. I don't, I'm not familiar with the, um, where he's from and the history of him or anything like that. So I'm just going to literally tell you what it, what it looks like to me, <clears throat> uh, from, and we'll start expressions and those types of things and the way he's talking, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think he's, he's trying to give the impression that he's glad to be there. So I agree with you that, that smile is something he's put on. It's a mask and, uh, but he needs to give his story. He needs to tell his story. So he still has that need because he's been sitting in there and that's all he thinks about is what he's, is what's happened. Um, obviously he's nervous because he's got a lot riding on this. So we're seeing a lot of things that tell us that, uh, the, his expression of a smile is a lot of people will confuse that with a Duchesne smile, a true smile, but it's just, again, the, the perfect thing, like you hear the psychopath, you know, when the mask drops, this happens. So that's what we'll, we'll term this as, as his, his smiling mask. Um, his vernacular is real as I didn't know he'd been there since he was 12. But I can tell this cat reads all the time, man, because when he talks, like that guy we, we talked to in, uh, um, where were we, in Greensboro, Chase, he, he's he's coming out with these sentences that are that are just set up structurally that are just perfect. His diction is perfect, and he's probably pretty smart by now. He may not have been back back when whatever that was that happened, happened. But I think he's, he's pretty smart because of the words he uses and the structure of his sentences uh, show that he's smart. Um and and that that structure doesn't change throughout the whole interview. The the, the structuring of a sentence. We'll go into that detail if you want to, but the way he he presents all this doesn't change at all. And he's pretty much said in the expressions we're going to see. We see almost everything that we're going to see in this first one throughout the video. Not much of that changes at all. I'm not seeing deception cues. Um, the head shake, no, like Greg said, it, it is um, trying to get away from the uh, expressing the negativity of it. But at the same time, he does it so often, it's part of his baseline. So we're going to see that the whole time as well. So it's going to be hard to, to nail down something. He's not really asking anything during this about being honest or, or not being honest. So we, we're not really seeing much there. But we see this throughout the whole, the entire uh, set of these videos. He's, he's pretty much the same. The whole There's a couple of changes in there, which we'll talk about. But he's pretty much the same throughout the whole thing. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so so I agree. The the smile there for me is an entertaining smile. It's put on there on purpose in order to, well, so the Latin for, for entertain is from entrepreneur to me, it means to hold together. It's there to kind of keep us engaged all the time. And so when things go uh, differently for him, we see it just collapse and drop really, really quickly. And we're going to see that, I think, throughout. Uh, 
on the word young, I think I see disgust and and potentially a, an edge of contempt to this idea of I was young. So that kind of interests me. There's some anger for me. The top lip tightens on uh, his his speech. So when he's talking about Kennedy's speech, so there's a sense of uh, remembering that anger to what Kennedy said, but this idea of, he, I think he's, um, there may be an element of, yeah, of true disgust around what he did at that time. Uh, now, I, now, of course, I realize that, and we see the expression collapse at that point, and he can't entertain us uh, anymore and and hold our attention um i wish i could reverse all my actions concerning robert kennedy and he hits that hard and we see a bitter taste in his mouth as well so so i'm seeing some some strong possibilities that there may be an edge of i don't know whether remorse but but um uh distaste and disgust around what he did in the past here uh, yeah, and, and a put on smile in order to entertain us. I, I think, Chase, it, that might be a, around uh, practicing for the parole board and, 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 and practicing for here's my chance to get out to the public that, I, that I'm remorseful and I'm a, I'm a good guy in the end. That's all I got on that one. Well, I would leave you with one other thing. If you grow up in a place where there's conflict, where there is conflict, you're going to learn to put the right face on the right thing. If all of us have been to war, you know that everybody is always friendly because they think they need to be. And if you're in occupied or what, whatever you want to call his situation, he would learn that early in his life. Right. Brilliant point. Yeah. Cool. All right. One speech that sets you off doesn't doesn't deserve a terrible fate like that. No, I, I agree, and I sincerely regret the, the, my my actions for that. I was young, I was you know immature, I was wild. I I I really didn't have the the ability to sit back and reflect on it as just one speech, one perhaps one pandering speech to a you know a potential block of voters whom he was appealing to. And now, of course, I realize that, and, uh, and, and, and I wish that I could reverse all my actions concerning Robert Kennedy. We good then? Yeah. Yep. There we go. But why did Robert Kennedy, the, the friend of the downtrodden, become the focus of this hatred? Because to me, he was my hero. He was my champion. He was the protector and the defender of the downtrodden and the disadvantaged, and I felt that I was one. And to have him say that he was going to send 50 phantom jets to Israel uh, to deliver nothing but death and destruction on my countrymen, that seemed as though it were a betrayal. And it was sad for me to, to accept, and it was hard for me to accept, and just uh, didn't, and, and the, my, all my hopes were focused on Robert Kennedy. I was his supporter. That was the quality that Robert Kennedy stood for, was hope. There was that loss of hope at, at the same time, say, you know, and this is the part that really, that really sort of angers me. All right, Chase, what do you got? So it's clear we can absolutely see him smiling through some emotional pain here. And when he's saying, I felt that I was the one who was downtrodden, I felt like one of those people, you see some glabella flexion, which Greg could probably demonstrate, which indicates disagreement or anger. And there's a micro expression of disgust at death and destruction. And when he says the word countrymen, keep in mind that his original Palestinian citizenship is still intact. So he kept his citizenship and never became a U.S. citizen, even though he'd lived here almost his whole life, uh, moved here when he was 12. And I can't say what I'm really seeing here without going into probably some three hour monologue about what transpired in this case because I'm, I'm tempted to every time we watch one of these videos i want to shoot off on the lapd medical examiner or you know some of the evidence is in the case uh but i'll leave it at that uh, greg yeah so a couple of things number one he almost goes to full-blown arab culture eye contact almost at one point which is riveting when he's talking to you and telling you something 
But 20 years in a prison will fix that for you. Because the last thing you would do in prison is to go and do eye lock with another prisoner because that's confrontation, especially in American culture. He's not a giant guy. There's probably some pretty giant guys in the prison he's in. I'm sure that plays some into his eye contact. But if you'll watch, he does some emotional eye accessing. I think you're starting to see him well up with how he felt at that time. Now, whether he killed Kennedy or somebody else did, not important in this discussion, but you see him starting to well up. His breathing increases fairly rapidly. He shifts to telling. He does emotional eye accessing, breaks away, looks back at him, starts to talk. His breathing comes up. He shifts to telling. His cadence increases and his tone starts to go down. And Chase, I think it's a little more than even a micro expression. I think his nose is pretty pronounced and that arch in his yeah. brow gets pretty damn pronounced. And he shakes his, she's shaking his head and condemning. And then there's contempt as that left side of his face rises a little. He does riveted eye contact with a break as he's sending his message. And I think you can't, I, I see a feeling of betrayal here. Everything he's talking about, here's this hero, and then suddenly all this negativity comes out. When you worship somebody and they let you down, this is what you get. That's what I see. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, absolutely. I see anger before he talks about betrayal. That may speak to something of a possible motive. We absolutely get uh, the that entertaining smile drop away on I was one of the downtrodden. And we get anger, disgust, contempt. So again, there's there's some real potential emotional reasoning for for this now it interests me that downtrodden is a metaphor that he mirrors from uh david frost david frost who's the interviewer here sets up the metaphor of the downtrodden he mirrors that i'm always very careful if i if i hear people especially if they're incarcerated mirroring other people's metaphors it, it triggers me that i they may not be able to make up their own metaphors that can in some cases speak to a certain personality type so i'm going to keep that in my, my mind as, as as i go along um also he has already elevated a, a figure to um uh heroic messianic status and he's already said that they they uh they betrayed him and there was a loss of of hope and he gives anger on that now also there's there's some certain um uh, uh psychological types who will elevate figures and then those figures will be demoted and there's huge amounts of uncontrollable anger that will happen around around that so again that that signals to me maybe we want we want to watch out to see how you know is that happening a little bit more does he mirror more metaphors as well so a few little indicators there that might help us look at personality type uh uh here and if you want to look out for those personality types just run a google of of, of what i've described to you there and you and you know you'll find some kind of dsm description heading up for you around that uh scott what do you got on this one all right. Yeah, you guys are nailing all this stuff. The expressions we're seeing are anger, disgust, concern, sadness. We're seeing all this stuff. And his cadence spe uh, speeds up, starts getting uh, quicker at this point. The way he talks is, is the length of his of one sentence becomes shorter because it's getting faster. As And as he's retelling his story, that's for the billionth time, the same thing uh, for the billionth time, that's when this starts happening. I think he's just so used to saying everything. He just starts getting quicker as he goes along. Now... Um, you guys are right when you when he says uh, the, when he talks about Bobby Kennedy. That's when we're seeing the disgust, and I think this is the, the um, and when he says this double standard, I think this is what the source of his anger is or was on that. I still think he feels that because he feels betrayed, and everything we're seeing body language wise, the deep breaths and the, uh, the as he's recalling the information. Um, this, I think this is the reason he's so mad because he feels betrayed and because he bought the story that he was being told by by the politician. I think he's really mad because he because he says again and again that um, they're getting ready to go bomb uh, his people. In other words, it was really it's really uh, that's I think that's what the if I was going to say that he had done something and that he had done this, I would say that's why because, through anger and that would be what I'd point to. But there are two parts to this, and the second part will be coming up in just a couple minutes. 
All right, we good? Hey, mm -hmm. one, go back and watch the first video. You, go back and watch the first video and look at his smile there and look at his smile here. His smile here looks like my ex-mother-in-law smiling at me. It's steely and hard. It's not a smile. It's, it's creepy looking. Go look. But why did Robert Kennedy, the, the friend of the downtrodden, become the focus of this hatred? Because to me, he was my hero. He was my champion. He was the protector and the defender of the downtrodden and the disadvantaged. And I felt that I was one. And to have him say that he was going to send 50 phantom jets to Israel uh, to deliver nothing but death and destruction on my countrymen, that seemed as though it were a betrayal. And it was sad for me to, to accept, and it was hard for me to accept. And just uh, didn't, and, and the, my, all my hopes were focused on Robert Kennedy. I was his supporter. That was the quality that Robert Kennedy stood for, was hope. There was that loss of hope at, at the same time, say, you know, and this is the part that really, that really sort of angers me. That was the quality that Robert Kennedy stood for, was hope. There was that loss of hope at, at the same time, say, you know, and this is the part that really, that really sort of angers me, that this, this double standard of, of, of the politicians, and particularly Bobby Kennedy. On the one hand, in, during the 60s, uh, during the campaign, he was all uh, in favor of, uh, of stopping the war in Vietnam, and he wants to bring our boys home. And in the, in the next breath, he wants to send more bombs and more uh, phantom jets to Israel to kill human beings, but, but Palestinians in this, in this instance. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, so, double standard. Uh, disgust and anger on double standard. Bobby Kennedy, we see a quite a pronounced nostril flare on that for, for anger. So in the images that we're already getting, it feels like it's setting up quite a good um, motive, <laughs> essentially. Uh, you know, regardless of whether you think he shot somebody or didn't shoot somebody, it seems like there's a strong emotional motive potentially there. Hard, hard K on kill. So, so that's, that's really a, a motive as well. He tries, I think, to put back on that, what I will call an entertaining smile, uh, an entertaining for, there's uh, potentially a number of reasons. Uh, why that might that might be being put on, and it drops on Palestinians in this instant. So again, uh, something very important, obviously about Palestinians, double standards from his hero, uh, disgust and anger to Bob, Bobby Kennedy. You know, in those last two videos, um, we're getting quite a good motive, emotional motive, building up here. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think this is mostly truthful, what we're seeing here. He, I mean, and when I say that, I mean he believes what he's saying. And his eye contact is a little interesting here. The closer he gets to the end, the more eye contact he's making here. And the eye contact on his key points is outside of his baseline, which is interesting. And keep in mind, he's been up for parole 16 times, or I'm not sure how many on this video. I think it was over a dozen here. And the parole board is definitively telling him, unless you remember exactly what happened and why you did this, you're not ever going to get parole. And I think it's very, very strange in this video. The word and the idea of countrymen is now gone. It's out of the window completely. And it's now humans. He even says in this instance, he, the words in this instance, or just it, just in this instance, it was Palestinians, as if it were of no consequence whatsoever. Like Palestinians no longer matter. 29 seconds later, it's no longer countrymen, it's just humans. That's a big deal when we're talking about motive, that the story changes that much. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. So I'll Tarantino this one. Because I'll go back to number two here in a second as, as a comparison. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're seeing an interesting uh, blend of, of, of micro expressions and expressions here. We're seeing disgust, a disgust and happiness blend. We're seeing shame and sadness, anger, regret, and sadness blend, which is, is, which is odd when you see that, but it's regret and sadness at the same time. And then pursed lips, which equals, that's when we know he's, he's 
that equals or suggests denotes disagreement. And then that fake smile. So when we go back to number two and comparison to the two, in the first two seconds is when we see, or the first 10 seconds is when we see all those micro expressions I was just talking about. First two seconds. And the second one we see all those again as well. Not all in micro expressions, but we see them in there as well. So this is, I don't think this is set up. I don't think he's trying to do that every time. But we are going over the same information as you were in the, in the, in the second one, basically, just a little bit more in depth. So I think, I think, again, we're seeing anger here from that going to bomb people. And I think that's, that was his reason for uh, being so angry. And um, especially when he, says that when, he was, he was, when he said he was sending jets, the Phantom Jets to Israel. That's, what, that's where most of it lies. And then the... Um, his, his mask or his show face is what I, I started labeling as that, uh, is an expression of, uh, that's, that shows, that's what he's talking about, his purpose, I think, in that. Not the anger part, but the part where he's smiling real big. That's when he's, he's almost trying to sneak in his purpose for doing that if he was going to be the one to do it. But that's where his anger's hiding, right in there. That's why we see that interesting blend of all those little micro expressions in there from both videos. Um, and it goes back to his, his show face again. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so a couple of things. Culture is important. We can't ever forget that. And in Middle Eastern culture, you're more liable to be polite because politics are a big topic of discussion. If you ever go to the Middle East and you want to go talk politics, you go drink tea, all the men are sitting around and it's politics, politics, politics. And it can get heated, but not angry. So in my exposure now, I've not lived my whole life in the Middle East, but in my exposure, most of those guys, and they would be very polite until they were escalated. And this feels a lot like that polite up to escalation thing to me. I've seen many times. His cadence changes. His Watch his neck. Watch the pulse in his neck. You can see that vein rising. And I'm not going to call out which one it is because my anatomy is failing. I forget which one it is. His eyes are moist, very moist suddenly. Before you didn't see tears. The, the kind of forming that kind of tear. There's contempt and sarcasm in his smile. His smile is now suddenly very steely, not like it was in the beginning. And his eyes are cast down right, and then he comes back to look at you. Regardless of whether we think he actually pulled the trigger that killed Robert F. Kennedy, he was in the room with Robert F. Kennedy with a gun, how he got there. That's a whole nother story, and he'll tell us that story. But it pretty much you can realize that going there with a gun is probably a bad idea. Today, you wouldn't get anywhere near somebody as important as, as Robert F. Kennedy, but in those days, it was a little easier to get close to people, even though his brother had been killed not that long before. So I think it's important to pay attention to the culture. It's important to pay attention, Chase, to his point, he's been in prison for this long. He makes eye contact because that's part of the culture. He breaks eye contact because it's something he's learned. But I think we can see that he's feeling contempt, he's feeling anger, he's feeling frustration. Even if there were another shooter, which I don't know, that doesn't mean he was not angry enough to go there and do this, whatever caused it. That's it. That's all I got. That was the quality that Robert Kennedy stood for, was hope. There was that loss of hope at, at the same time, saying, you know, and this is the part that really, that really sort of angers me, that this, this double standard of, of, of the politicians, and particularly Bobby Kennedy, on the one hand, in, during the 60s, uh, during the campaign, he was all uh, in favor of uh, of stopping the war in Vietnam, and he wants to bring our boys home. And in the, in the next breath, he wants to send more bombs and more uh, phantom jets to Israel to kill human beings, but but Palestinians in this in this instance. All right, cool. So, the months before the assassination, Sirhan kept a diary. In it, he wrote over and over again. RFK must die. I don't even refer to them as diaries, really. They were just uh, scribblings more than, more than you know, detailed uh, by, you know, uh, entries in a, in a diary. But you no. said RFK must die by That's what I recall that. June the 5th, things like that. Yes. But I mean, throughout that period, were your feelings just getting stronger and stronger, or what? They must have been, obviously, but I can't say that there was any deliberateness to the killing. At that, I mean, they, not all my feelings were, you know, were be were drumming towards that goal of of assassinating Bobby Kennedy. No, but uh, it was just in general that, uh, I, and I wasn't just typical of me as an Arab. I think that a whole Arab community in this country uh, felt, you know, uh, downcast, 
and crestfallen by the defeat of the by their defeat in, in, the, in the Middle East. Chase, what do you got? I said it all before we started, but you got mad uh, that we hadn't started yet. <laughs> so here's here's what I got. Uh, during the reporter's questioning about the diaries, Syrian's blink rate is upward of 70. I think it's an 81. It slows down. I have to look at my notes. I think it's an 81. I can't read. Uh, but it slows down as he begins to answer here. And just keep in mind for you, if you're ever talking to a person, blink rate increases with stress and decreases with focus. And that focus could be I'm focused on a threat or I'm focused on something that's very interesting to me. That's like a, a good movie. But a lot of what we're seeing here is indicative of a memorized statement, which also does not make it deceptive. He's been rehearsing this stuff for a very long time to, for parole boards, and that does not make it deceptive. Uh, but I find it interesting that he's unable to explain his feelings whatsoever, but he's more able to answer questions about those feelings. And even just saying, uh, well, I sir, it, it must have been, or and there's some uncertainty about motive here. There's micro expressions here of anger, disgust, they're flashing on the face right during the discussion of the feelings at the time leading up to the assassination of RFK. And keep in mind, uh, there's a whole lot of data here that we're not going to get into whether or not he did it or not. Uh, but he is conflicted in the stories that he's been telling have changed and evolved over the years to this new narrative. Uh, that is what the parole board has been asking him to say. Uh, for decades, several decades. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it gets quite, it's not, so there's a real change for me in this in this moment. And it's kind of hard now for me to track what's happening here because in watching him and listening to him and mirroring what's going on, I kind of lose my train of thought. It becomes a little bit chaotic. Um, so I'm just kind of throw ideas at you <laughs> because because that's all I can do with this. Um, it's it's hinted there of, of of some kind of what I might term as psychotic writing going on and that he has no memory of it. So I might call that automatic psychotic writing. Okay. I just want to throw that idea out there. He doesn't remember doing what could easily be termed as a, a, a writing that's coming out of psychosis. Um, uh, there's, there's hints of uh, paranoid schizophrenia there, essentially that the idea of, of, um, of double standard, betrayal, distrust, hatred, okay? Um, but dependence on a savior figure. Uh, that hints to me around borderline personality disorder, okay? Now this isn't true, this is not a diagnosis by any, by any means, but there are elements in there that, that are pointing to psychosis, schizophrenia, and borderline could be, and they, you know, they they meld and merge in all kinds of ways, and they're on a spectrum, and uh, you, and you know that. Um, but those elements can precipitate into what we call predatory violence, i.e., planned planned acts of violence against the perpetrator of of the betrayal. Now, you know, I've thrown a lot of ideas out there because he gets very chaotic for me around this, but there is a massive shift between who we had before and who we have now who cannot remember what looks like a, a psychotic uh, event. What looks like, I don't know whether it is or not, but it points towards that. Uh, Greg, what do you have on this one? Yeah, so I'm going to say this, and we'll decide whether you take it out or not, but his ass is in a sling is what this is. He's doing a duplicitous story to cover up some information is what I see. I mean, just, yes, I wrote that down, but it was he minimizes like whoosh, very quickly. Oh, it was more like a, a doodle pad. It wasn't really a journal. Who cares? If you're writing down Bobby Kennedy must die, try that tomorrow and let somebody find it on your desktop about a president or presidential candidate and see where it takes you. So he has to come up with a, I'm not sure I remember, but he also has to be helpful. I, the reason the stress rate goes up, in my opinion, is because I'm about to go before the parole board and Frost is asking me, hey, 
do you remember planning to kill Bobby Kennedy? Well, what, what am I supposed to say? Oh, yeah, 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 I wrote that down. I was preparing. So I think you put him in a position where he has to say something. But mantras matter. If you write something enough, if you write something over and over and over and over and roll it over and over and over in your head, it becomes part of your operating system. It just does. We all know that. I mean, if you chase you and I were indoctrinated by the military, that works. We know it works. Now you are, you know, hypnosis stuff and all that. I know nothing about hypnosis, but I know mantras work. I know when people repeat things to themselves, they impact them. And, and you make, can't, you can't delete them. Like no, if you're watching no. this right now, finish the sentence, Mary, Mary, quite. Yeah, exactly. It's stuck. And even if you try to delete it, no matter how hard you try, it's there forever. Well, it, it, it's worse than that. You can repeat jingles from cereal and soap from your childhood. I'm 60 almost, and I can repeat jingles of soap, things I didn't care about because it's in your head, it's stuck there and it's routine. So he minimizes, he has that nervous smile, his mouth is suddenly dry. This is an indicator that he's on the ropes over something. He shows disgust, his blink rate goes up, and then he goes to the blame sharing of all Palestinians felt this way. Yeah, but all of them didn't go shoot Bobby Kennedy. So there's the problem. Do you really wanna share that with your countrymen, with, with Palestinian Americans? But he doesn't do that. He does a lip compression, and that's when you can see that he's feeling stress around this whole thing. And he uses a large word, crestfallen, but he's well read. You can't miss that. And when you learn English as a second language, you're more likely to have more flowery vocabulary. I've often been told when I would go to the Middle East where people are speaking street language and you come in and you sound like, you know, something really proper. They just look at you like, where'd you learn that word? Because it's so odd. So I think you see a lot of that in this guy. I think he has a duplicitous story. He's hiding some facts. And whether or not somebody encouraged him to do it, that's another story. Here's what I see. Scott, what do you got? All right, great. Uh, this is this I like this one the most because for me I'm seeing a lot of things that we don't we don't see very often. Um, being one of them being the uh, the part where he says, uh, I can't say there's any deliberateness deliberateness to the killing. We saw we see what's called an emotional emblem. And the emotional emblem is being used as a conversational punctuator. And the emotional emblem he's using is disgust, but he's not really feeling disgust. He's showing us, like again, I've talked about it before, when you when you say, oh, the food there is horrible, you make the disgust face, but you don't feel disgusted right now because you're not dealing with the food. So he's, he's showing his disgust for it and punctuating that with that expression, in other words, with that emblem of, uh, d the emblem of disgust, not necessarily having real disgust. Now, out of all 100 plus shows we've had, this time we hear this guy whisper yes quieter than anybody else, especially when he's admitting to have done something. So that's after he says, um, when he says, I recall that, and he says yes. If you'll look really closely, he says yes. Really, it's a real, real small. You can hear it really, uh, really super quiet. Even who's that girl that, would, that, that we did? And she said yes. Like that, she whispered yes to Dr. Phil. Oh, yeah, that was um, Aaron, Aaron Caffey. Aaron Caffey. Right. Okay, My favorite, yeah. crazy. That, yep. Yeah, that was pretty quiet. That was fairly quiet. This one, this is going to be hard to top. We're looking for this one. Now, there's one part where he blows the air up into his lip like this, like like that. Not that big, but it's, but that's the idea. That's because, um, and Frost says, he's talking about throughout that period, and he's ready for the question. He's like, yeah, here we go. I've, his answer is loaded. It starts too soon. Now, we're not dealing with anything as far as, being deceptive or being honest here he's just telling what he thinks but that goes to show you what happens when someone's told a story over and over and over again and he's tired of answering this and he's showing you that slips because he doesn't make a big deal about it but watch that upper lip that's when we'll see, when we see that happen he's tired of saying telling the same story over and over and over again um the expressions we're seeing is that smile again, but it's that mask or that show face just to look pleasant as, he, as he's going through this because he knows it's key. This is important to him. He's trying to sell this to David Frost. Um, I'm, I'll leave it there. I got a bunch of those little things, but I'll, I'll leave it right there because it's going to be boring quick. All right. We good? The months before the assassination, Sirhan kept a diary. In it, he wrote over and over again, RFK must die. I don't even refer to them as diaries, really. They were just uh, scribblings more than, you know, detailed, uh, by, you know, uh, entries in a, in a diary. But you no. said RFK must die by That's what I recall that. June the 5th, and things like that. Yes. But, I mean, throughout that period, were your feelings... Just getting stronger and stronger, or what? 
They must have been, obviously. But I can't say that there was any deliberateness to the killing. At that. I mean, they, not all my feelings were, you know, were, be, were drumming towards that goal of, of assassinating Bobby Kennedy, no. But uh, it was just in general. That, uh, I, and it wasn't just typical of me as an Arab. I think that a whole Arab community in this country uh, felt, you know, uh, downcast and crestfallen by the defeat of the, by their defeat in, in, the, in the Middle East. That's yes, moved. But again, this, this terrible punishment for one speech about phantom jets, I mean, haunts people, I think. It does haunt people. But suppose that you were a black or Hispanic living in America and had Robert Kennedy as your ideal champion, as your savior in America. And had you all of a sudden heard him say that he was going to spend, send some 50 jets to destroy all the black or Hispanic pop populations in this country, how would you have felt and what would you have done if you thought that you could do something about it, you know. And that's what you thought, you could do something about exactly, it. that's exactly, well, imagine though, that if you were a German or if you were a Jew in, uh, in, in, in Hitler's uh, Germany, and if you had the opportunity to assassinate Hitler, uh, I'm sure that uh, they would have tried to, to do that. What, to me, I felt But there's that no comparison between Hitler and Robert Kennedy. Agreed, agreed, but the principle so it seems to be similar. Wow. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so once again, we get the uh, mirroring of the metaphor. Uh, Sir David Frost puts forward, it haunts people, and Sir Han says, yes, I think, yes, it does haunt people. Again, that always, um, you know, alerts me that we may have a certain personality type that likes to mirror metaphors, especially because it's, it's poetic, and they often don't have the capacity for that poetry and uh, and chase you were saying earlier that you caught him quoting which writer earlier on what's that you, 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 you were saying yes he quoted fitzgerald earlier on oh yeah sorry yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. he quoted fitzgerald yeah yeah so um so that's kind of interesting he's collecting he's collecting poetic ideas and then mirroring them immediately uh anger and disgust again um just as a little aside he he evokes something we call godwin's law which is the longer a conversation keeps going the more likely somebody's going to mention uh and and allude to and link it to to adolf hitler and nazis and and those so straight into godwin's law on on film for uh, uh, on on film number five here uh just as a general rule so you all know that is never a good way of winning an argument in fact uh, Godwin's law says the moment you do that, you lose the argument. So, um, so there's an element here of him liking to mirror other people's language, especially poetic, and going for what we now to be know to be one of the most naive ways of trying to win an argument, which is to go well, just like kind of Hitler and the Nazis, isn't it? Um, so I'll end I'll end my piece uh, there. Chase, what do you got on this one? I think it's uh, pretty fascinating. There's no discussion of how he felt at all, at all. It's relating to how the reporter would feel or how most people uh, would feel. And this smile, I think, is his way of getting along with authority. And after that many years in prison, that kind of rewrites, rewrites your behavior. And his uh, agreement with all these metaphors, he's still unwilling, completely unwilling to discuss his own motives openly or clearly uh, by any measure, which I think is, is very interesting to me. Scott. All right. I think in, in this one, if you're into micro expressions, like in the second video we saw, we saw two in the first 10 in the first two seconds. This is fascinating. You'll, you'll, you'll really get into this because what we're seeing during this, we've seen the lowest blink rate of all the videos. It's, he's almost staring at him the whole time. And I think it's because this is the most important and telling of all the questions is it because this is why he did it, supposedly. He's saying why he supposedly did it. Um, 
We see him at, at the top. He adjusts in his chair because he's preparing to give this answer, and he knows it's important. He's got to sell it. So he's, we see that adjustment in there. And then after he says America, uh, and uh, suppose you're a, you're a black or Hispanic living in America, we see the classic anger cue there. Classic stuff in, the, in their micro expression. So that's where you're going to see that one. Then he says, when he says, uh, when he gets to the part where he says when, when, it, when he was going to send 50 jets, again, we see that seat adjustment, and that, that indicates he's angry as well. That indicates he's angry there. Then we see the, the uh, micro expression of anger on your Savior. And when he's talking about him, no, seeing him as your Savior. And then when he said, I heard him say, we see a, a micro expression there as well. You have to go back through there and watch these, but that's where we're seeing those. Now, all of these things are happening, a lot of these are happening really, really fast. We're seeing, um, 10 micro expressions of anger in less than 30 seconds, plus nine of disgust um, and anger. Six of anger, four of disgust, so that's 10, not nine. It's, it's unbelievable how much, how much is going on in this, in this cat's mind, how much, why he's fighting something in there. So maybe as the discussion we were having a few minutes ago uh, offline, maybe that's what's playing in, into this. Maybe he's being made to say this or so he can get out. Maybe he knows he has to say this because there's there's a little little war in there going on with what he's saying and what he wants to say and what he doesn't say, but what he is saying. Sounds like that Dr. Phil thing where he knew I knew, he knew I knew I knew I knew or whatever it is. He knew I knew, I knew, he knew I knew, <laughs> and he knew I knew, he knew I knew. <laughs> Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so what I see here is this really isn't about the Jets. This is about something else. I could same thing. There's the Jets is a nice talk, but his discomfort and him moving and watching his respiration increase and his eyes lock, all that's agitation. I those are great indicators. I interrogated people for a long time. That's a great indicator that it's time for me to drive harder and it works wonderfully. When I see that if I were interrogating this guy, I would use something called pride and ego down right there. And I would say Oh, yeah, I, I get it. You're trying to save the world. It's a shame that you sucked at what you did. And I'd go at him to push him really hard to make him respond. It's natural when a person starts to show that agitation and you poke on them, they come back at you harder. It works wonderfully. Um, he also then adapts, touches his head, I think, at one point, And you see his cadence of movement start to get different. He's starting to get wooden and everything's changing. That's a great indicator that a person is starting to feel fight or flight and that you're inside where they want you to be. And he also does this tilt of the head, try to see if you tilt your head too and link up. That's instinctive for us. If you at work tomorrow, there's someone that you're linked to and you have kind of a, a already a bond with, if you'll tilt your head, you'll notice they'll mirror you. And we do it instinctively. It's in our nature to, to find out whether somebody's connected. The other thing is when he talks about Nazis, even he is uncertain. It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? So Mark, he knows it's the dumbest way to win an argument and he drops off. That's all I got. I'll leave the rest of it. You guys have already covered it. All right. But again, this, this terrible punishment for one speech about phantom jets, I mean, haunts people, I think. It does haunt people. But suppose that you were a black or Hispanic living in America and had Robert Kennedy as your ideal champion, as your savior in America, and had you all of a sudden heard him say that he was going to spend, send some 50 jets to destroy all the black or Hispanic pop populations in this country. How would you have felt and what would you have done if you thought that you could do something about it? You know, and that's what you thought, you could do something about exactly, it. That's exactly, well, imagine though, that if you were a German or if you were a Jew in, uh, in, in, in Hitler's uh, Germany and if you had the opportunity to assassinate Hitler, uh, I'm sure that uh, they would have tried to, to do that. What, to me, I felt But there's that no comparison between Hitler and Robert Kennedy. Agreed, agreed. But the principle so it seems to be similar. This guy sure talks like he's smart. You said in the trial, um, I killed RFK with 20 years of malice of forethought. Now, you're, you obviously did not know him. What were you trying to say? I tried to really show that the Palestinian problem did not just suddenly erupt with the shooting of Bobby Kennedy, that there was a, a history to it that dated back to 1947, 1948, uh, when the 
the palace, when the, the state of Israel was created forcibly on the Arabs, and when the Palestinian Arabs were forced to uh, evacuate and uh, be expelled from their homes and lands uh, to accommodate the, the new arrivals, the new Jewish arrivals in Palestine. I feel that having experienced what I have experienced, in Palestine, atrocities, the killings, the violence, and just the uprooting of, you know, of massive uh, populations uh, it did have an impact on me, I suppose, more than it did on, on others. By, by, by saying this, I'm not trying to discount the seriousness of the killing. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if you start in the very beginning, he's apprehensive. You see his blink rate increase before he starts to talk. And he has a sticky hand movement, almost like his hand is glued to his leg and he tries to move it and it kind of jerks as he moves. That's fight or flight. When we say it's fight or flight, when your adrenal cortex kicks in, when you have that, and when the amygdala gives you there's a threat, your body starts dumping all these hormones in, respiration increases, your body is then trying to prepare for fight. And so you'll move more rigidly, more wooden, your elbows stay close by your sides, your, your pupils dilate, your blink rate may increase as your, as your eyelids dry out and they're trying to wet the eye. I'll just leave it at that. Well, for that part, his cadence is wooden, fight or flight is up, watch his respiration. The culture part of it is starting to kick in when he says evacuate in that long vowel. A lot of people will jump and say there's a long vowel. That's Arabic. There are three vowels in Arabic, and when one is written out, it's pronounced very long. So no big deal there, I don't think. He's annoyed. He's on message, and he's telling. He's a little frustrated with the interviewer, and he's got some disgust and contempt when he's talking about Palestine, talking about all the things he's seen. And then finally, he's aware of how he sounds and he's trying to get his message across here. Guys, whether the big conspiracy question is whether he killed Robert F. Kennedy or not. The big conspiracy question isn't whether he took a firearm to the hotel and shot rounds. So this is all going to be an interesting one. We're looking at that part, not at who killed who. <laughs> to, to quote John Cleese, let's not quibble over who killed who. And Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it, there's one thing that's consistent in the behavior here is that he is reluctant to say what he wants to say. You can see it in the first five seconds. You can see his face kind of grimace as he's talking. And keep in mind, I'll just remind you, if you don't know, his childhood was fraught with severely traumatic experiences. He was exposed to combat and death and uh horrible things, which makes him very prone as an adult to dissociation and has a higher, what we call a dissociative capacity than most people. And, you know, it came to the USA when he was 12 with all of that stuff. So we're seeing that come out here in some of his behavior, his brow narrows down when he's speaking about this experience when he was in Palestine. And I think everything he's saying here is mostly truthful. His behavior is on message, and he is being truthful about uh, these traumatic experiences. Scott? All right. Uh, his, his cadence and tone are fairly monotone here. And that's indicating he's told the story, again, just throughout the years, over and over and over. He's, he's kind of tar tired of telling it. And I agree with you. There's, there's a little, there's little, little fight going on there. Now, expressions we're taking a look at, again, these are great blends of expressions, like a smile and concern blend. As you go through this, watch for some of these things when we, when we replay it. Watch for these these blends of two different uh, expressions happening at the same time. And they'll one will start and the other one will come with it sometimes, and then the, sometimes they'll both just go together and, at the same time. We're seeing blend, uh, a blend of disgust and anger in here as well. The most interesting thing to me was, and this has nothing to do with with whether he did anything or not, when he's talking and he says uh, something uh, did I, did have an impact on me, I suppose. I suppose is Southern. If you listen to that, it sounds like Greg's thing jumped. I can always tell when people have been over there from from the deep south or from the or for, from family that it, that is you know from further deeper south than than Greg is living in now. You don't get much reverts, further, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, So, because you revert right back to that on certain words. Yep. Yep. And on this one, he says, I suppose, like an old man, you know, like an old southern man. So I don't know if he's been hanging out w with one or what, but listen to that, because you can definitely hear him say, I suppose, like that, almost, <laughs> you know, in that, that southern drawl. It's tight, and it's not as long, but it's there. 
so I'm just pointing that out as he's hanging out with somebody from the South. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so again, smile falls away. That entertaining smile falls away. And, and I think we're getting some of the fastest blends through, you know, different uh, facial gestures that, I, that, you know, we've probably ever seen. Uh, just as you're saying, Scott, you've got anger and disgust and they're flowing in and out super quick. Knitted eyebrows, concern, dislike. Um, atrocities, violence, killings. There's some uh, hard stress on those. Uh, speaking to your point there, Chase, around around trauma and part of his argument here is to go, look, I, I experienced um, the if I experienced this uh, maybe somewhat more than others. And now he's pointing towards, well, that's probably why I did what I did. Now, there's some validity to that because high levels of trauma are, are going to precipitate um, more possibility of borderline personality disorder, antisocial behavior disorders, um, um, uh, dissociation, just as you're saying there, Chase. So, um, so there's some there's some validity to, to what he might be saying there if we were looking at what do we think his uh, uh, psychological motives might be and how might they precipitate into a state of mind um, that th that will organize violence, uh, uh, you know, right up front, or could commit violence and not remember that that occurred. So I think, you know, whether he knows that or not, it's, it's, it's well thought out what he's saying there in terms of, you know, here's why it happened and here's why like somebody like me might do something and I might not remember that that, that, that happened. There, that's what I got on that one. You said in the trial, um, I killed RFK with 20 years of malice of forethought. Now, you're, you obviously did not know him. What were you trying to say? I tried to really show that the Palestinian problem did not just suddenly erupt with the shooting of Bobby Kennedy, that there was a, a history to it that dated back to 1947, 1948, uh, when, the, the, when the, the State of Israel was created forcibly on the Arabs, and when the Palestinian Arabs were forced to uh, evacuate and uh, be expelled from their homes and lands uh, to accommodate the the new arrivals, the new Jewish arrivals in Palestine. I feel that having experienced what I have experienced in Palestine, atrocities, the killings, the violence, and just the uprooting of, you know, of massive uh, populations, uh, it did have an impact on me, I suppose, more than it did on, on others. By, by, by saying this, I'm not trying to discount the seriousness of the killing. Cool. When you went to death row, was that a surprise or did you think, well, if this had happened in an Arab country, it would have been an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and well, I'd be dead anyway? It's, it's an interesting question. If, if I had shot Robert Kennedy in an Arab country, I seriously doubt that any Jew, Arab jury or Arab court would have convicted. And if they did, the punishment would have, would have been nothing more than a slap on the wrist, knowing the dynamics involved, that Robert Kennedy was an advocate of full support for Israel. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think he uh, agrees with the emotional content of his message here, but I think he's reluctant to say a lot of these things. You can see this repressed anger, the suppressed grimace on his face as he's going through this. I think he does not want to say this, and I don't think it's because he said it so many times. But I think he believes in the emotional content of what he's saying. He dodges the question completely and reframes it pretty damn well, I think. And a lot of this stuff that we're hearing here is rehearsed after decades. There's these micro expressions of anger and restraint and uh, almost disgust on the nose. It, it's hard because there's so much blending. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's mixed emotions. Let's just say mixed emotions. And these mixed emotions are what we very commonly see in people who are 
either A, saying something they don't really believe or don't agree with, or B, this is one of those videos where somebody's making a hostage video and they say, oh, I'm being treated very well and everything's perfectly nice and they're being very kind to me. <laughs> and you'll see mixed double facial expressions, uh, as Scott calls blending. Uh, and I got that from Eggman, so that's not mine. Yeah, or Mark would, might call it a Vitamixing. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the time, though. yeah yeah so mark uh, what do you got Vitamin. yeah um it, it, it there's just a complexity there for me it's going through so i mean uh, nothing i think that we haven't seen before but it's more of the same a lot of complexity there going through a lot of emotions which which you know i, I don't know exactly why that is but i know something is up there so, quite complex going on in his mind around this. Uh, and so it becomes disconcerting, I think, for us as an audience when that entertaining smile suddenly drops and he's going through all of these very, very negative emotions very, very quickly. We get we get a, a real, you know, it's a good mask of, of it's a pretty good mask of pleasure and entertainment and enjoyment and engagement and then bang it's gone and within seconds you've gone through anger disgust disdain uh, concern very very quickly it's dis disconcerting for you as a viewer to, to see that because the brain just goes I don't get it and he doesn't go oh, I don't get it that must be good he must be a good guy it goes I don't get it that's really bad he must be a bad guy so we always default to the negative when it's too complex, it's too confusing for us. Uh, interesting thing for me is how he really, uh, you see him reset himself on that question. To your earlier point, Greg, you know, that might be a moment where you you go in harder on that. He, you know, uh, David Frost doesn't go in any any harder and and Sahan gets to reframe that question, just as you, as you said there, uh, uh, Chase, um, I, it feels to me the reset might be that that it is an interesting question, and he hasn't been asked that before. It may be something that is that is going. That's an interesting cultural question that Frost has come up with there that's never been posed to him and it is quite skillful that he goes yeah i'll take that one over here and i will get out my ultimately uh political diatribe you know i'll, I'll go for my political thesis on on this because i want the audience to know that it was there's some justification to my actions you know there's uh, that i'm that not i am justified in this but but people can probably see that that it would be justified to be angry about this and to be upset about it there that's what i got on that one uh who we got left greg i think yeah yeah so a couple of things yes he masterfully avoids the question but he also distances from the question that that's an interesting question i've heard that i can't tell you how many times in an interrogation room when a person wants time to think so he's trying to think of the answer and i think he's probably had elements of this answer many times chase i'm with you i think he doesn't want to say something I don't know what it is and the reason i think he doesn't want to say something is so in arabic vowels are not even written in the newspaper they're just not there so when arabs speak they use consonants katala that's a word that quickly. And as he's trying to get the information out and get away from it, he switches to that very short voweled speech pattern. And we don't hear that long supposed that you were talking about earlier, Scott. We don't hear any vowels that are long. His consonants are clicking right along, more like Arabic than English. So he's trying to get away from something. He's short, he's curt, his cadence has shifted. He's on message for what he wants to say. And all of that body language that we're talking about, all of those changes, if you have children, you've seen this before. Children are little subjects. They're not allowed to violate your rules. You get to tell them whatever. You can make all kinds of rules for children that ordinary adults don't have to deal with. But when you're in prison, you're a little bit like a child. You're not allowed to disrespect. You're not allowed to do any of that. So if you're trying to hide emotion, that's going to go through all kinds of things. When you're annoyed, you certainly don't want to show annoyed to a guard. You know, it's the whole when you're a little kid and your parents tell you, I don't care what you say, I can see your body language. Well, when you're in prison, you certainly don't want to be the guy who is sending all kinds of messages to prison guards either. So all that masking, I think, causes people to rifle through lots of emotions a lot more rapidly. Just my exposure in my years of working in a prison. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, oddly enough, I think we're seeing the expression of confidence here at the top of that thing. 
So, it, and, and as we go through, and we are seeing the blending of emotions and, and, and or expressions, uh, but there's not much different here. You guys have, have covered everything. The part where he says, knowing what Car- Robert Kennedy, that Robert Kennedy was an ag- advocate in full support of Israel, uh, we're back to the same expression of anger and contempt at that point. So, outside of that, I mean, I'm not going to go over what you guys have gone over so far. So, When you went to death row, was that a surprise, or did you think, well, if this had happened in an Arab country, it would have been an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and well, I'd be dead anyway? It's, it's an interesting question. If, if I had shot Robert Kennedy in an Arab country, I seriously doubt that any ju- Arab jury or Arab court would have convicted. And if they did, the punishment would have, would have been nothing more than a slap on the wrist, knowing the dynamics involved that Robert Kennedy was an advocate of full support for Israel. You ready? Yeah. What happened on that terrible day? Well, after I finished my activities at the firing range, I started heading home. And on the way home, I stopped by a restaurant, Bob's Big Boy, and had dinner and socialized for a while, leaving the, the restaurant. And I picked up, I bought a copy of the newspaper, the LA Times, and uh, started the leafing through the pages to reach the, the sports section. And, ha- and while doing so, I noticed uh, an advertisement announcing a parade that was planned to be held that evening, and it was to celebrate uh, the Israeli victory of, 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 the, of the year before. And it was to, to be a sort of an anniversary parade for the, for the for the Jewish community in LA, I take it. And uh, that sort of incensed me. And I said, well, I have nothing else to do tonight. I'm going to go down there and see what those people are up to. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? He shifts in his chair right off. We don't even see him, and he's shifting in his chair. He's uncomfortable. He uses some prison words, activities. You know, when he says, I did activities at the, um, at the shooting range, you might look for a reason. But when you're in prison for 20 years, you do activities in the yard. You do activities wherever. That's just prison language. So you just don't think much of it. But his respiration is up. He does nervous laughter. He makes, he's starting to tell the story of this target of opportunity. He's agitated. There's something going on that his cadence, how he talks, is different than it has been to now. And he's looking down to the right, which we usually associate with some kind of emotional thing when he's talking about the story. And it's not, I don't know whether the agitation is because of what he's talking about or because of where he's gotten to to now, because he's kind of gotten on the griddle a couple of times. So who knows? Can't tell exactly why, but he's certainly annoyed with this whole conversation. And he shifts one more time in the chair at the end. That's what I see. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, He's still telling the story he's told before. But we do see some interesting things here. And that, and the second time he does that seat adjustment um, is when he says, I know it's an advertisement. Then he adjusts in his seat because this is where he's getting PO'd. This is where he's getting mad. You can see the anger building up in him. We see that nostril flare and a couple of micro expressions of anger and, and, and some more flaring of the nostrils. I think he's getting mad here. I think this is what sort of became the trigger if he, was, if he hadn't been, if it was him. This would be the tr- one of the triggers when he said, or the beginning of it, where he says, I decided to go down there and see what they're up to. You can see it building in him. You can see him holding back that anger as he, as he goes through this. I don't know, fellas. It, it, I mean, he's looking pretty mad during all this. Um, and the expressions yeah. we're seeing are micro expressions of anger. His blink, blink rate's really low. Everything's leading up to this boiling point, it looks like. So it starts off again. A lot of these start off where he's fine, everything's good, but then very quickly moves into, you can see it emotion, the emotions uh, r- rising in him and all the classic signs of him. Chase That's why I think you could push his buttons pretty easily. Yeah. 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 I think the emotions are real. I think uh, yeah. he believes what he is saying, uh, wherever that's coming from. But a lot of the language here, I'm just going to focus on language and not the nonverbals, is very sterile and clinical. I just finished my activities at the range and then went and socialized with some friends. And while doing so, there was a parade that was planned to be held. This is clinical 
language, uh, and this is book language. So on one hand, this is a memorized statement uh, that he may have made up or rehearsed many, many times. On the other, people in prison read a lot of books, a ton of books. I worked at maximum security for uh, quite some time, a military maximum security area, and there's a lot of books, uh, mostly Louis L'Amour. For some reason, there's a bunch of Louis L'Amour books in there. Uh, so you got to fall in love at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's all Western, Western. But uh, there's a, a perfect classic micro expression of anger. Like like Scott was saying, this is a one of those ones you could you could frame shot that whatever the name of that is and save that for a training. That's like a training level, perfect illustration of anger, right when he's saying, I'm going to see what those people are up to at the end here. That's all I got. Mark? Yeah, so let me pick up in just one moment on that clinical language, because it's it's very interesting for me. But body language, I'm going to go to uh, David Frost, where you, you'll see that the camera uh, picks up uh, a couple of self-soothing gestures from him. So even the, the filmmakers here want to want you to know that this is a little unnerving for David Frost right now. Whatever this character is coming up with, they want you to know that David Frost needs to soothe himself around this and I think that's because uh, uh, they want to highlight the clinical nature of this language and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna evoke Godwin's law right now to say what we're what we're potentially being shown here is the banality of evil which was ascribed to Adolf Ekman and uh, Ekman came up with something that that he called uh, I can't remember the exact German for it but it basically meant bureau speak clinical language that you could use before uh, and leading up to uh, killing on mass so that people felt kind of okay about it you know, it's okay, it's just, it's just what we do. And I think we're getting this kind of clinical language in the lead up to this, um, this m murder, potentially. Um, and it's disconcerting for us to, to hear somebody go, and then I went for a burger, and then there was a parade going on, and I thought I'd head over there and see what it was like, and then it's just plain odd, isn't it? Just plain odd. But I want you to notice, in just one moment, uh, the filmmakers are going to start playing with us a little bit more and kind of up the stakes on us on how weird uh, this one is. But anyway... So David is finding it very, very odd at the moment. What's going on here? There, that's what I got for you. What happened on that terrible day? Well, after I finished my activities at the firing range, I started heading home. And on the way home, I stopped by a restaurant, Bob's Big Boy, and had dinner and socialized for a while, leaving the, the restaurant, I picked up, I bought a copy of the newspaper, the LA Times, and uh, started leafing through the pages to reach the, the sports section. And, ha and while doing so, I noticed uh, an advertisement announcing a parade that was planned to be held that evening, and it was to celebrate uh, the Israeli victory of, of, the, of the year before. And there was to be a sort of an anniversary parade for the for the for the Jewish community in LA, I take it, and uh, that sort of incensed me. And I said, "Well, I have nothing else to do tonight. I'm going to go down there and see what those people are up to." Yep. There we go. At the time of the shooting, I was not really in full control of my senses, Mr. Frost, because I don't feel that a, a rational, uh, calm, cool, and and a, a person who has his wits about him and is uh, aware of his environment would actually pull a gun and aim it at another human being and shoot at him with the foreknowledge that after you finish shooting that that person is going to be you know, dead. All right, I go first on this one. Get it out of the way. Um, they're adding this unneeded, creepy vibe music to it. <laughs> That's just, I mean, it's it, Chase did a whole thing on uh, when you add, when we did, back when we did, uh, what was it, the uh, 
Tiger King, how they add creepy music to stuff to make it, and you give it that, you know, it tells you what to think, in other words, or how to feel about what's happening. And uh, that's what they're doing here. So I just think it's unneeded. And during this, he's defining the reason he needs to be paroled as he goes through this. And um, if what he was describing is true, I think he was in a rage when he did this, when, when he supposedly did the shooting. And I, I can see it ramping up to that. I think we can all see it ramping up to that. And they're telling us that as well with, with the music. So that makes me, when they try to push you down that, that mouse path like that, that makes me go back against it and go, eh. Because a few minutes ago, I thought, well, maybe you guys are into something a little bit to the, you know, to the left there. But I think, I don't know, when they start that stuff, they're wanting us to think something specific. So I don't like that. That bugs, <laughs> bugs me to death. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, he's got this working nervous smile. The sad truth is if they didn't have this Castlevania soundtrack crap going in the background, this is a normal guy. This is a guy saying, look, if I did that, I was not in my right mind. I'm not rational. And if you look, he's got normal body language. Eye contact's pretty normal. He's got a nervous smile, but that's constant normal eye contact for the culture he grew up in, that kind of thing. And I think you would see a different person if they didn't play the soundtrack to Castlevania behind you. So I, I, I want to see this more, and we will see it come back to this. There's no more pretense. It's just a nervous smile, a lot of eye contact, trying to be a rational actor is all I see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, the music they're using is, I think, specifically to remind us of the Twilight Zone. And so I want you to think about that idea of the Twilight Zone, that moment between uh, when the sun is up and, and, and darkness falls. They're using a, a, a structure, a, a cadence structure. By cadence now, I mean the intervals between notes. They're using an interval structure of a 12-tone interval structure, which is uh, first the music of the German expressionist, Schoenberg, a little bit of kind of Stravinsky esque nature at the end to give Slavic drama to it uh, at the end there. Um, this, for me, evokes the idea of the early German expressionist films uh, like Nosferatu, which includes a sonambulist, a sleepwalker. So they're evoking the idea of somebody being dissociative. They're not in their right mind. They have gone between the state of awake to the state in and the state of a sleep and they're somewhere in between in a sleepwalk state is the idea i think that they're trying to get uh, across which i think is interesting and i'll leave it at i'll leave it at that uh chase what do you got for us even more interesting and i'm not even going to say it here on this video pull up your shazam for that song and take a look and where that came from. Where did it come it took, from? Tell it, me. I'm not. It, it took me a few different times. What is it? It came from the original movie with Frank Sinatra called The Manchurian Candidate. Oh. Yeah, they did it intentionally. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I knew it was going somewhere weird, man. Yep. Yep. It took me a while. <laughs> okay. So, uh, He's obviously he's smiling during all the parts. He wants to have some kind of agreement or when he's likely to bring up something that's disagreeable. Uh, and he's specifically using some of these phrases in full control of my senses. I was not in full control of my senses. And he's saying a rational, calm, cool person. And he's removing himself with this distance language uh, who has his wits about him and is aware of his environment. And then he's like, I don't know if that person would take a gun, aim it at another human being and shoot at him. He uses the phrase shoot at him, not shoot him, which is very interesting here. And I do not think that's severity softening uh, by any measure. With the foreknowledge, this is continuing his words, with the foreknowledge that after you finish shooting that that person is going to be dead. This is extremely dissociative language. This is the definition of what dissociative language sounds like. And this music, whole nother level. <laughs> Greg? I just... 
Uh, we will go again. That's what we're doing. <laughs> did I? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't think yeah. you did. All right. Yeah, this is 10, right? <laughs> yeah. We're all okay. okay. It's been so a long few days. Right it's now. been a long few days. All, right, let me hit this. All, so, yeah, yeah. He, he looks. So, g give it to me again. Okay. Hold on. And leave this in. That's all I've got. No, no, I did do this. I did do this. <laughs> Yeah, you're talking like him it's now. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether I did it or didn't do it. It's oh too late guys. at night, guys. Come on, guys. Let's finish Chase this. got up at like four this morning and headed out back home. <laughs> I get Carolina it. When we got finished. <laughs> Jeez, man. Okay, yeah, we're moving on. She whiz. Let's do 10, and, and do we need to do 11? Um, at the time of the shooting, I was not really in full control of my senses, Mr. Frost. Because I don't feel that a, a rational, uh, calm, cool, and, and, and a, a person who has his wits about him and is aware of his environment would actually pull a gun and aim it at another human being and shoot at him with the foreknowledge that after you finish shooting that that person is going to be you know, dead. I'm told that he was scheduled to traverse a route that was totally different from the one that he actually took. And uh, had he, had he said, for the stroke of luck or, or fate, you know, had he taken the original route which he was uh, intended for him to take, he, he might have been saved and he, he might have been, you know, become president of the United States. I was never part of any conspiracy. For me to enter into a plot with another person to kill a third, is totally out of the question. If, if you knew enough about human nature, as I have experienced in prisons, where, if, where two people had gone into a conspiracy and uh, one of them ends up on death row and the other one ends up uh, a state uh, witness. Looking at it in, in retrospect, I wish that there was a conspiracy, because had there been one, it would have aborted as soon as it was you know, begun, and Robert Kennedy would, uh, would still be alive. Okay, Chase, what do you got? So when he's starting to use his language, I'm told that, I think he's insinuating or suggesting that he wasn't or couldn't have been lying in wait. And it's important to know that he's using language that might be suggestive of that, uh, without saying any of it overtly. And, and he's saying nothing about his own innocence at all. So this behavior, uh, wishing that RFK took another route, is enthusiastic and remorseful at the same time. There's genuine head movement and recall. For, uh, it's different than the rest of his behavior throughout the rest of the video. And there's a genuine desire for approval here. Uh, in saying that he might have been saved. I believe it. Anyway, I'm the first one going. So I don't know if you guys are going to disagree with me. But there's, there's grief and shame at the same time when he mentions the word president. His head goes down. He has a, a chin boss uh, tightening up. Tiny little micro movement of the chin boss. But I think it's interesting that he very vehemently in, emphasizes that he himself was not part of any conspiracy. He uses the word I very boldly and strongly uh, compared to every other part of his speech ever. And he excludes himself from other, what he, what he calls persons uh, that, that may have been involved in this thing. And I think that's an interesting statement that should be a, maybe an orange flag. We'll call it an orange flag. Scott? Okay. Uh, I'm spent, man. Uh, uh, let's go on. Let's go on to uh, Mark. What do you got? Yeah, uh, Roger that, Chase. So, so the, the stress on I, I uh, was never a part of any conspiracy. I would dig deeper into that. That, that interests me. Uh, Greg, maybe, you, maybe there's something cultural there. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it, it certainly triggers something in me. Uh, there's a big head movement um, for if but, if but a turn of fate. So he's there's this idea of a couple of different timelines going on here. Again, signals some kind of, you know, disassociative state, potentially. There's a huge narrative here of, of 
a, a, a champion of all mankind, a world savior, it could have been saved themselves. That's a big story. Like that is a massive idea. That's a massive idea that I don't think I've even come across <laughs> before. If but for a turn of fate, if not for the fates, the savior could have been saved. That's a massive story. And so, and so, you know, to kind of tie this together in, in, at this late state of night in a, in a slight sonambulistic state myself, what are we dealing with here? We do have some indicators of, of the huge loss of a huge savior for somebody, if not for the fates could have been saved and, and the, um, the horror of, of that and the anger around it and not being able to control the anger. You've got extreme anger, paranoia, dissociative states, a sense of abandonment. It does fit very strongly a specific personality uh, type, um, which can plan um, violent action or can get triggered very quickly into into uh, violent action. So so I just want to put that there because there's all kinds of, of, of great evidence and great theories out there, but I will put that down there. Um, also, I just want to flag up that when huge stories like this happen, when you have somebody of huge status who 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 has a crime committed on them in quite innocuous ways, our brain can't take it, doesn't understand it. It's the killing of a king by, by a complete surf by accident. So I just happened to be there, bang, dead. And, and, and if, that, if that's true, if that actually happened, it would be so hard for our mind to be able to deal with that. So we're always gonna want to con construct, whether true or false, we are gonna want to construct a better reason why this happened, because it is unreasonable to the brain that this should ever happen. I don't know whether he did it or not. I think he's certainly there with a gun. <laughs> I think he certainly fired some shots. It's going to be, it's a tough story for us to take. And he's created a massive story uh, here. Um, Chase, what do you got on this one? You've been, haven't you? Mark, <laughs> uh, what do you got? <laughs> I'll go. Don't I'll even, go. We'll just get even, mine out of the way. So, I'll just buy into it. Craig, what do you got? So, Mark, I'm going to sound a little bit like you at this point. Um, <laughs> Arabic culture is tightly tied to many, many, many centuries of legends and that kind of thing. So a lot of the stuff they talk about when they talk about fate, there's a great story of a guy named Hatim Ta'i, who was the most generous guy on earth. And there's a word they use in there where they say, azil, which means the sword has already fallen. Nothing you can do about things that changed. So there's that part of a culture that will matter in a spoken language that has generations and generations of storytelling. I think there's a certain element of that in what he's saying. However, I do see he goes downright for some emotion. He gets a little agitated and then he says, I was never. Baseline means something, always, always, always. His baseline changes dramatically for one moment and that's his forehead is up and held up high as he's asking for approval. Does that mean he knows someone else was involved? Don't know. But what he is in effect saying probably is, I, I don't know, but it's not me. And you can see it. He goes back to that baseline without the creepy music, and it looks like a person saying what he believes. So in this case, I would poke really hard. Mark, you were looking at what he says and the words, I was never. I'm looking at his forehead up at the same time. I'm thinking, yeah, I'd spend a little time on that one and try to figure out what he's trying to tell us there. What do we know from there? Don't know, but that's certainly a pretty powerful request for approval at a time that we're not accustomed to. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> that's good. I'm, I'm done, man. I'm told that he was scheduled to traverse a route that was totally different from the one that he actually took. And uh, had he, had he said, for the stroke of luck or, or fate, you know, had he taken the original route which he was uh, intended for him to take, he, he might have been saved and he, he might have been, you know, become president of the United States. I was never part of any conspiracy. For me to enter into a plot with another person to kill a third is totally out of the question. 
if, if you knew enough about human nature, as I have experienced in prisons, where, if, where two people had gone into a conspiracy and uh, one of them ends up on death row and the other one ends up uh, a state uh, witness. Looking at it in, in retrospect, I wish that there was a conspiracy, because had there been one, it would have aborted as soon as it was you know, begun and Robert Kennedy would, uh, would still be alive. Let's pass okay. it around the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's throw it around the room and everybody very quickly, very quickly, let's just say what we think about what's going on. We'll start with Mark, go to Chase and then Greg, then I'll wrap it up. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, um, th there is, a, regardless of, of what actually happened here, I, I would say there is a absolutely a, a, an effective disorder of some sort here. There is a, a, um, a, 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 um, a psychosis of some sort going on here, in my mind, uh, for sure. Chase, what do you got? It's hard for me to comment on the behaviors here. I've been obsessed with this every day of my entire life. Uh, for 15 years. And uh, I've, I've met with the attorneys. Uh, I've, I'm involved uh, in, in some regard in the case. Um, but I think that this is what we're seeing is a person saying things reluctantly. And some things are being held back. The, the behaviors don't match up all the time. And there's genuine anger there. And it's hard for us to, uh, I'll speak for myself, it's hard for me to know whether that anger is from the subject matter or from the having to speak about this uh, in, in many of these instances. At, at the end of the day, uh, you could wrap this thing up in a polka dot bag and just, you know, call it a day. Greg? Yeah, so what I see in these videos, forget all the conspiracy theories, all that stuff for a minute. I see we're talking about a guy who took a firearm to a hotel where a guy was killed. Whether he killed him or not, don't care. If, you know, a guy with a horns grown out of his head killed, don't care. Not, not part of my analysis here. What I see is progressive levels of frustration, aggravation, and some annoyance and hiding body language and having a duplicitous story as he walks through till he gets to the end. Then he starts to talk. He tells us something that looks true, but he does something odd. Did he kill the guy? Don't know. You you guys who know all the ballistics, yeah, figure that out. But what I see here is a guy with progressive levels of irritation. It sure sounds like he was irritated about something. That's what made him go to the hotel with the gun. That's that. Scott, what do you got? I think you nailed it on that. We're, from the very first uh, video, as we go through, we see the anger getting growing and growing and growing. Although it's small, and I'm, I'm with Chase on that as well. Is it because of what's what's happened or what's going to happen? Or is he mad and that was used against him? I have no earthly idea whatsoever. But the body language in here says that his anger is there and it's it's right under everything going on. If this is the outside, this is the inside, and here's the anger. And boy, it's big. Pounded on that, trying to get out. And he's doing a great job, I think, of holding it in. But of course, we know how to look for those type of things and point them out. But I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of anger in there. This guy is is frustrated and he's angry. For what reason? I have no earthly idea. But that's what we're seeing in there as far as what I can see. So, all right. Well, uh, has anybody got anything else they want to add to this? Yeah, yeah. Sub subscribe. <laughs> sub sub subscribe. Right. Like, you know. That's Scott. That's your part where you go, hey, well, if you like what we're doing. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, <laughs> you do it. <laughs> Uh, well, if you like what we're doing, go ahead and hit on that uh, subscribe button right down there. It won't hurt a bit. And you'll become a panelist and you'll get notified of these videos. You can listen to them in the shower. You can listen to them in the kitchen while you're chopping cucumbers. You can listen to them anywhere you like. Thanks for watching. It's just like me. Good one. Just like me. Good one. All right. Well, this is good one, fellas. And uh, I'll see you next time. See y'all. See y'all. Good Lord, you guys. Yeah, hey, guys, uh, thanks for getting doing this, for waiting until tonight. It was the only way I could make it work. No, that's good. And, and my that's mom good. would have liked this one, so this is a good right. one for us to do. Right. Yeah. We were delirious. This one's for her. This uh, one's for her. Yeah. The Behavior Panel. Damn it. Can I go back? Can we do that sure, again? Sure, man. What do you got? <laughs> at, this, at this late hour, what do you have? <laughs> I'll go. I'll do one. Um... We all done? 
Did I miss somebody out? Greg? <laughs> Other Greg. So, so we're going to what now? Five or six? Uh, no, six. I think no, that's five. No, no five. We just did. Do five. We just watch it or we do? Wait, I uh, completely lost my, what the hell I was going to say. <laughs> well, that's, that's cool. All right, we'll start over again. Ready? I'm behind in all this. Sorry, I said to make sure I was right on that. Mark, did you recognize uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald in that? Language? No, I didn't. Where was that? All of my feelings are drumming towards the killing. Oh, oh, he he reads nice. a lot, clearly, yeah, as well. You nice. can't miss yeah. using words like crestfall. Hey, 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 which, which one are we on? Nine? This is nine. We're on eight. No, we're on eight. Okay. We're on eight. We're on eight. Okay, sorry. No, no. Long, it's, it's, yeah. long few days. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. Um, hold on one second. Okay. Um, shit. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm burnt, too. Um, oh, no, oh, yeah, I'm still chewing an ice cube. That's too bad. <laughs> this is nine, fellas. No, it's, no, not, it's, it's eight. eight. It's eight. It's eight. It's eight. <laughs> okay. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I got. Scott, what do you got? I agree, I agree with all you guys. And I'm not going to go over what you've already gone over. That's, that sounds bullshit. I'm not going to do that. We'll just move on. <laughs> that's fine. I'll be sad and 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 I'